Um, so good evening, everyone. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to Murad. And uh, as you can probably tell, our topic of discussion here today is on rock inscriptions. So welcome, Murad. Thank you for having me once again. So in particular, um, I'm going to be looking at Yehuda Nebo's chronology of rock inscriptions because I feel that this is um, a much overlooked bit of knowledge that needs to be shared. And uh, so why should we look at the rock inscriptions? The first reason it allows us to ground a reconstruction of Islamic history on tangible evidence. We can determine developments in the culture and see how they correspond with Islamic tradition. In many cases, these are dated, giving us solid evidence. We can examine if Islamic ideas have taken hold at a time when Islam is said to have begun. And we can see precursors to Quranic phrases and vocabulary. Any thoughts on that so far, Murad? Yes, I like the idea of the rock inscriptions, of course, because maybe it goes well with the numismatic evidence also, so we can see what you have here. Yeah, um, it's my view that it actually it parallels the new the numismatic evidence very well, and uh, you know I suppose one argument that potentially might be used against this evidence is that an absence of evidence isn't evidence for absence. But I actually think that when we take the fact that we're looking at a summary of about a hundred thousand inscriptions across a large geography. It's hard to make a case that the fact that we are not seeing certain types of evidence um, is just by accident. You know, it does reflect what's there in the culture. See, I wanna, I wanna comment about absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. We, we kind of like, uh, we just repeat this phrase. But actually, sometimes absence of evidence is evidence of absence. If yeah. you go into a room and you say there is an elephant in the room and, and you do not see it, then there is no elephant. So if Muhammad was this very large character and for years you do not have it on rocks or on coins, then you have a problem. Yeah. So this is my comment on this part. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And uh, yeah, I'm surprised actually people don't see that. You know, you know, it's it's for the Islamic tradition to prove that it is that it is true. Um, it's not for us to to prove vi vice versa. It's the burden of proof is with them, and as we'll see today, it's not there. Yes. Um, and uh, another reason why we look at rock inscriptions is we can trace Islam's 150 year development. It's obviously a bit longer than that, actually, but at least the crucial 150 years we can trace through the rock inscriptions. Okay, so the main thing to bear in mind, first of all, is there's two types that we'll be looking at. One is the official royal inscriptions. These represent the words and ideas of the elite. And the second type are the popular inscriptions, and these represent the words and ideas of the masses, you know, the ordinary people. Yes. And what follows is a summary of Yehuda Neville's classification and findings. Let me just see, has there something else? We will look at the popular inscriptions first. Um, any thoughts on the, the main differences between these two, the official and popular, um, Marud? Or Murad? Uh, no, I would, more or less, I would like to just check now, yes. Okay. Okay, so we'll start with the basic text. So these are um, the earliest types of texts that are found on the rocks. Um, basic texts can be indeterminate monotheists, mostly undated. Basic text, which is a subgroup with Judeo-Christian opening phrases. Um, and then there is a basic text, which is dated or datable to circa 85 AH or 704 AD. Okay. Yes. So... So these are diff there's different categories within the basic texts. And uh, before we look at example, I suppose the main thing I would suggest is these basic texts um, are pre-Islamic, we should say, even though they occur in Islamic times, they have pre-Islamic characteristics. So some phrases start in the basic texts and occur unchanged into the Muslim period. So there's an overlap. 
common feature is a request for forgiveness. A later feature is a reference to lasting forgiveness or forgiveness for future sins. So when we see this type of forgiveness mentioned in inscriptions, that already gives us an idea that it's much later. Um, this Abdul, is, uh, interesting. Yeah, I, I think never, this... I never knew that. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing. So you can actually see how their religious views are changing in this edition. So um, there is a movie um, that Tom Cruise starred in, and I forget the name of it. Perhaps you, can, you might know it. And it's about um, a cop who's preventing crimes before they happen. Or they're, it, he's, he's basically like a time lord. And he knows when someone is about to commit a crime and he arrests them beforehand. Have you ever heard that movie? No. <laughs> I, I, what I might do is I might look it up afterwards and might put it up. But, but essentially, this asking for future forgiveness is kind of like that. It's almost like pre preempting future sins by asking for forgiveness ahead of time. So that's all I want to say on that one. Um, so um, common expressions, Abdul Allah and Amir al Muminin. Um, I'm not sure if I pronounced those correctly. Um, yes, it's Abdullah and Amir al -Mumin. Yeah. These are not specifically monotheistic in, in this period. Like later they become monotheistic, but in the early period, they're not necessarily. And we know this from the context of the wider inscription. So that's important. So sometimes people say, ah, oh, this is an inscription from say the 640s. This must be monotheistic, but it's not necessarily. Um, I, I want to add something to this uh, before we go to the next point. Yeah. Uh, Abdullah, uh, the, the Syriac Christians, they use it. So it just means servant of God, or something like that. Yeah. It and can. As you know, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Allah, as you know, is a generic Nabataean name. And yeah. Amir al uh, the new studies I'm looking at is that it has, it means like the leader of the Mu'mineen group or Mu'mineen movement. So this doesn't necessarily mean Muslims. It yeah. could be Christian, but a believer, something like that. And Bella knows about the Mu'mineen movement. So these are the people which is the reference to. Yeah, it's like commander of the faithful is one translation I've seen, and it's very generic. It doesn't necessarily mean Muslim. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly like this. Yeah. Okay. And so in this period, no inscriptions have been found of Ba'it. I think that's how you pronounce it. Resurrection. Or um, ha um, I think you pronounce it as Haz Hazar. Would that be right? Uh, the, the first one is Ba'ath, yeah. which is resurrection. And the other one is what? Summoning of the dead. Have you ever heard a word like that? It may be a really old old word. I think it's pronounced Hazar or something on those lines. Um, again, this is, yeah, this is from Yehuda Neville. It, it could be a really, uh, well, it is a very ancient word, so may, perhaps it's gone out of date, you know. But um, so these words um, have not been found. Um, so in other words, it's an indication of an absence of belief in the afterlife. Um, but they do occur later. So it's an interesting thing. The earliest of uh, occurrence of these occur in the late 8th century. This is long after Islam would have started. Okay. And uh, very notable, this is the elephant in the room or absence of elephant in the room. Note the absence of references to Muhammad and the afterlife in the basic text. So this is crucial. Okay. Um, so I'm going to look at some examples. Um, indeterminate monotheism, forgive Lord of Musa. Moses, um, a Judeo-Christian subgroup would have something like the following, forgive Lord of Isa and Musa, and I have included the, the uh, what's it called, the code that goes with that particular inscription, just if anyone wants to look that one up, um, I haven't done that in all cases, and then forgive Allah, Lord of Musa and Isa, um, notice that this uh, word for Jesus which is contained in these inscriptions could be an explanation for its use later in the Quran. Um, and they're not using um, the Christian version of the name Jesus here, which is kind of notable. So it's, it's, it's a reflection of this Judeo Christian group rather than um, a Christian group, if that makes sense. 
uh, I oh. can see that. Uh, yes, uh, I can see here. Lord of Musa, Lord of Isa. Maybe this is the, uh, the, the classic archaic Muslim, quote unquote, or uh, the believers. So they were believing in Musa and Isa, but still Muhammad didn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very so generic. It like this. Yeah, it's a very generic group of believers. They're monotheistic um, and they followed sort of Old Testament ideas and also some of the Christian ideas. It's kind of a mixture. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see if we've got... um, here's a longer one. Forgive my Lord and my God, the one who wrote this kitab and the one who read it and then said, Amen, Lord of creation. Amin, Rab, Allah, Amin. Now, the word kitab here normally means book, but in this context, it would mean inscription, right? Yes, uh, actually, interesting. The word kitab, we now know it's book, but it just means writing, something that is written. Yeah. You see? Not not anything more than that. Yeah. Um, Amin, Rab, Allah, Amin is a very common uh, phrase that's used in a lot of the inscriptions I've noticed. And of course, that comes into the Quran because it's just a really popular one. You see, I want to say something about the word Al Alamin. In Arabic, yeah. they do not know exactly what the word means. And in English, they just say creation, like you see here. But this word could actually be Syriac, and it means like the above heavens, the, the higher heavens. So, Lord of the, of the highest heavens, something like that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's a quite, quite a different... The upper, upper heavens, yes. Yeah. And it's it's a very poetic phrase, and I can see why it would be quite popular among, you know, for inscriptions as well. But, yeah. Yes. Um, another one here. In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful, Allah, forgive. So we have the forgive part. Uh, Mijan bin Said, his transgressions, the earlier ones and the later, verily, you are the omniscient, the mighty judge, amen. Um, any thoughts on this one? This is a little bit like say it in Arabic today, but still it's uh, a little bit different, you know, yeah. uh, just a little. We see it like this in Arabic today, yeah. Um, so, no, but, but it's good, yeah. The, the, the key thing I would draw people's attention to there is the fact that. We see a development here of the forgiveness part, the earlier ones and the later. So we, obviously this is a much later example in the basic text. Um, now, there's lots of elements there that could easily be confused as Islamic, but there's no reference to Muhammad anywhere. So um, we can see that a lot of the vocabulary that's later used in the Quran is, is prevalent in the culture, but we don't have any signs of Islam yet here? Yes. Okay. Now, so we move on to um, another period. So this is dated to 112 to 117 AH or 730, 736. Um, so this time frame, um, why is this significant? So this is about 40 years after the say, the reign of Abdul al-Malik, well, let's say from the beginning of Abdul al-Malik's reign. Um, and this is the first time that we can really find any inscriptions that are, are Mohammedan, not necessarily Islamic, but they are in reference to Muhammad without the full, fully fledged theology of Islam. Okay, so these texts recognize Muhammad as a prophet and a messenger of Allah. Note that this appearance is very late. It's a hundred years after his death and lags by decades the first official Mohammedan inscriptions. Many points of Islamic theology are missing. Use of forgive still exists, but incline is increasingly used as a supplication. Um, any thoughts on that, uh, Murad? Um. I think I have a different idea because I showed you the tombstone of Abassa in Egypt yeah. uh, and the date goes to 691 but uh, I do agree that it still doesn't sound very Islamic but it has the word Muhammad 
yeah. as Muhammad Prophet of God, but it's 691, nothing before it. Yeah. Was but, that an official or a popular inscription? That the one that you uh, mentioned? I'm not sure, but I think it's popular. I think it's yeah. popular. It could be that um like I suppose it's, it's all a question of um the extent of the ingrainedness of the religion at this stage. Like six nine one is really the beginning, I would say. And it's only at this period, 730, that you really see it prevalent. So it took a long time for it to be taken up by people because, you know, the Christians carried on being Christian, the Judeo-Christians carried on being Judeo-Christians, the pagans carried on being pagan. It took a, a long while for it became um, prevalent. So there's, um, what I'm trying to suggest, it took a few decades for a cult of, pop of what was I going to say, a cult of personality to develop around Muhammad, and this is when we really start to see it. Uh, I want to say something because I'm now reading about uh, the Hijra or the the calendar that the early Muslims used to use. You have this Arabic calendar, which is like uh, you have on the Muawiyah inscriptions and stuff. We automatically assume that this is the Hijrit and it goes by the moon. But when you look deeply, you find that uh, some people in Iran used to date after Yazdegerd, the third of Persia. And this is a different date than the Arabic one. So yeah. even this is a little confused. So when it says on the tombstone of Abbasa, just the date without anything beside it, we should be a little uh, skeptic. So this is important. And I suppose if we're if we have a situation where there's different standards being used for dating at that time, it, it, it would go a long way in explaining the confusion in the histories from that time. It is very hard to decipher which is which at this point, uh, especially in the Umayyad period. Yeah. But uh, these dates that I see now, 730, uh, these are uh, exact dates. I think it's the concrete is now set. Yeah. Okay, so let me see if I can. Here's the first one. Allah forgave Al Ward bin Salim his transgressions, the earlier ones and the later, and upon him your favor and lead him in a straight road. Amen, Lord of creation, Lord of Musa and Haruan, and him Harun. who. Sorry? Harun, which is Aaron, his brother. Ah, right, okay. And him who recites and him who says Amen. It was written in 112 in the Caliphate of Hisham. So this is actually a dated one, which is very handy. So we know precisely um, what's there and the date of it. Um, as you can see, the forgive late, the uh, the later sins is is mentioned. Um, and we don't see anything to do with Muhammad in this one, but we'll see some examples where um, it does have that. But, uh, before you go, I want to tell you something. You see here, Lord of Moses and Harun. Yeah. Uh, remember when you told me that there was a cult who worships Moses? Yeah. And I also told you that there is a cult which were crazy about Harun in yeah. uh, Petra. And when they did their graves, they did it pointing to Harun's graves and yeah. maybe Harun actually was Dushar. This is another crazy theory but we are getting closer. You see they are here obsessed with Moses yeah. and Aaron. So this is good. And another thing is when I look at these names al Ward ibn Salim I do not know this guy. There is nothing about him. Who is this guy? Yeah. So this is <laughs> important to note. Well this was these um, inscriptions would have been uh, inscribed for just general members of the public who would have paid uh, an inscriber to put this to get this written for them and it was a way of i suppose it's like um having a prayer said for you you, you got an inscription done and it, just the act of making the inscription is a prayer in itself and and hopefully anyone who comes and reads it will also add to that prayer that was what's behind it um, yes, so uh, maybe there's something like this today, but maybe in the old times it means that this guy was rich. So that yeah. He can, yeah. Yeah. It would probably, uh, for for anyone who was handy with a chisel, it was a handy way of making money because there are literally thousands of these. 
and uh, they chose people who were you know who were able to to make good inscriptions nice clear inscriptions rather th and yeah what else was going to say these inscriptions are very formal um there's not much variation in the formula by which they're written they follow a set standard um so it isn't like um graffiti nowadays where someone says uh, Marud was or Murad was here and uh, how are you doing and hello world and stuff like that you know it's it's very it's very specific and every word is weighed up and probably weighed up because you're paying for it so a person would have written down what message he wanted to have inscribed and then the uh, inscriber would have uh, taken time to make sure it's perfect but, uh, okay so we'll have a look at the next one in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful Allah, forgive Nahar bin Amir and provide for him from your bounty and accept him into your love and bestow fully upon him your favours and make him one of the prosperous. Forgive Muhammad, the messenger of Allah and the one who wrote or writes his inscriptions and the one who recites it. Um, say, Lord, sorry, say, Amen, Lord of creation. And there's two things that I wa want to draw attention to. One is love doesn't feature in the Quran, and, and say is a common feature of the Quran. Um, was there anything in that? We Obviously, we see um, a popular uh, reference to Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, and so on here. And uh, interestingly, he's asking for forgiveness for Muhammad. Um, any thoughts? Do you repeat this uh, number two? Sorry, do you want me to reread the, the passage? Two. Number two, I didn't uh, hear it. Yes. Uh, okay. So I just drew attention to the fact that it says, uh, uh, forgive Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, and the one who wrote his inscriptions and the one who recites it. So um, we have our first reference to Muhammad. In, in terms of the examples, let's say. Um, oh, any... uh, yes, but what date is this? This is dated to um, a period from 730 to 736. So these are collections from that period. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that this is the very first popular reference to Muhammad, but just the first in the set of examples I've given here. Maybe, maybe at this point, Muhammad died and someone wrote this for him. And this will be this will put that he died at this date. Maybe. Well, possibly. I um, I I I find that hard to believe unless because of the fact that we have uh, official inscriptions related to him um, earlier than this. I think it's that would be for me that would be a bit far fetched. I think unless this is just a random Muhammad. A different Muhammad to the the one from the seventh century. Says, but it says the messenger of Allah, so uh, this yeah. is not a random one. Yeah, yeah. This is strange, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. As a Muslim, you do not say, "Forgive Muhammad," because he is forgiven right away. This is the messenger. Yeah. So, yeah. so maybe at these days, uh, he was still uh, regarded as a mere human, and yeah. asked for forgiveness for him. This is. Uh, Maybe we can take this out of the inscription. Yeah, that's actually, I think that's an important point, actually. Um, we, so we're kind of seeing um, the beginning development of a cult of personality around Muhammad. So in the early days, it was very realistic that he was just an ordinary human being. And, uh, and, and the interesting thing, even Allah was an ordinary God in the sense that he, he accept him into your love, whereas later Allah turns into a bit of a monster where you rarely refer to his love. Would that be fair to say? Yes, and uh, it could mean also something else. Forgive Muhammad. Remember when when you brought up the source that says that uh, the dogs started eating him after he died yeah. and that he was an egomaniac and stuff. So maybe forgive him because he was an egomaniac and he was yeah. crazy. So maybe it is in this sense. So we don't know. Yes, yeah, something yeah. It's very hard to know. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's let's move on. Yes. Uh, let's see, I just seem to be frozen here. Right. Okay. Um, another nice short one here. Amen, Lord of 
Muhammad and Ibrahim, dated 736. So this is a very precise one. Um, now, the, I like this one in particular because um, Abraham was particularly popular in the Negev area. Uh, I believe this inscription is from that area because uh, that was the main focus for Nevo. Um, there was a, an Abrahamic sect that still existed at that time. Any thoughts on this one? Yes, I think this is good because when we pray as Muslims, Sunni, we say uh, give forgiveness, not forgiveness, but like exalted is Muhammad and his people, yeah. and Abraham and his people. So this inscription, it links Muhammad with Abraham and the idea of the Abrahamic religion, and Muhammad is from this seed and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. That's what we get from this. Okay, so we have um, the next one here. Um, I'm going to read it. Allah, incline unto Muhammad the prophet and unto him who prays for him. And Tuaba bin Maruf wrote it and he asked Allah for Aljana by his love. And I have here a note, reference to the afterlife is generally absent in basic text inscriptions. So we're beginning to see um, a kind of a reference to the afterlife, Al Jannah. Um, let me just see, there was something else I wanted to say. Well, yes, the word incline starts to appear during this period, it's quite a late word. And from then onwards, it becomes more and more common. And it seems to replace the word forgive. So instead of asking directly, forgive this, all they're asking is, is uh, for, for God or Muhammad or the angels to incline, which is kind of means to kind of condescend to the person who's praying. Um, any thoughts on any part of that? It seems, it seems like an evolution uh, for Muhammad the prophet. So he started as a mere man, then things keep getting uh, more evolved, I, I guess. What yeah. do you think? Yeah, there's a yeah, he's he's certainly it's a step up for Muhammad from forgive Muhammad, to incline onto him, suggests that he's now sort of considered more as a person of importance and virtue and so on. Um, what about the word Al Jannah? That's tends to be translated as heaven. Is that correct? Yes, Al Jannah is heaven, and it literally means that. Uh, you know, like uh, a place where there is uh, gardens and stuff, like a big garden. Actually, it's a reference to the Garden of Eden, if you look at it carefully. Yeah. So getting back to the Garden of Eden, getting back to Al Jannah, which is in heaven. So yeah. yes, this, this is just heaven. And I think this inscription, you can see here that during the Abbasid time, uh, things start to get uh, more for Muhammad. What do you think? How do you mean got more more for Muhammad? What do you mean? Like uh, he is turning more from a mere human into uh, a higher status. Yeah, like He's turning into a demigod. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, he also again, he asks Allah for, for Al Jannah by his love. So again, we see Allah is viewed as a, a kind of a loving God. Um, and we we start to see um, an absence of that much later in the history. Yes. So that's quite interesting in terms of that in the early days, it was very like the Christian idea of God. Okay. Yes. Which might indicate actually this is partly where it's getting the idea from maybe. Um, okay. Now, um, this next one. Um, do you want to read that one maybe? Uh, yes, because the Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it might be easier. I I, Abdullah ibn Ali, request of Allah ar rahmah and have recourse to him for shelter from the fire on the day of reckoning. Okay. Uh, says me, and this is a person, Abdullah ibn Ali, he requests yeah. ar rahmah ar rahmah which means like forgiveness or something. Yeah. And have recourse to him and to shelter him from the fire. Uh, and this is, of course, on the Day of Judgment. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I've heard, I don't know if you've, if, if you've seen this, but uh, 
the idea of referring to God as uh, Rahma, or Ra I think it's sometimes Rahma, maybe, is a is a word that comes from Yemen. It's um, it's what the Christians down in Yemen would refer to God, um, and it emphasizes God being merciful. Have you heard something on those lines? Uh, no, but you see in the Aramaic, Rahma just means uh, compassion or something like this, forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. But uh, of Allah ar Rahma here, it's uh, asking from Allah, so it's not like uh, a synonym for Allah in this particular inscription. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move on. Um, and we kind of we obviously uh, from the fire there it might be a reference. It's a day of judgment, but also the fire of hell, presumably. Would that be right? Yes, because when you say on the day, this is the day. There is no yeah. other day. And yeah. uh, here you can see that it's a little different. In the above one, you you are asking him for the love and going for Ghana or Jannah. But here, uh, you are asking not to go to hell. So maybe it's, it's, it's still getting worse. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so you can see the negativity starting to creep in. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. All right, next one. Now we're on to the next period, early Muslim. And you, we might be surprised how late the early Muslim period, um, 160 to 170 AH. And obviously, I'm just putting AH just for formality's sake. But obviously, we, we realize that AH is, is probably a much later um, way of terming it. Um, 776 to 787. OK, so late 8th century. Now, what can we say about this? So first inscription here. Allah and my Lord Saeed bin Yasid, and he is an excellent patron and an excellent helper. Saeed testifies that there is no God but Allah alone. He has no companion, and also that Muhammad is his servant and messenger written in the year 164. Um, now, my reading of that, just straight off, is that Saeed bin Yasid is the person who's been referred to as an excellent patron and an excellent helper, or is it referring to Allah? What's, how, how do you read that? I have to see it in the Arabic, but I guess it's about Saeed, uh, this guy, not, not Allah. Yeah. I guess this is the logic in yeah. the reading. Yeah. Now, we have um, the Shahada referenced here, but... Am I right in thinking this is um, this is like a three-part shahada, which is different from the standard shahada? Yes, today you say there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his servant and messenger. But yeah. this is the classic one when you have it like three parts. <laughs> yeah, and this is the one that you you find in the Dome of the Rock. Yes, because you see the classic one is there is no God but God. He has no other companion. This is the earliest one. Yeah. So they just add Muhammad. When yeah. time goes by, they remove the middle part and then it's the first and the last part. Yeah. And uh, what's nice about this one is it's dated again. So we have a very specific um, benchmark. And I think the, the, the beauty of the rock inscriptions is it gives us benchmarks. You know, we sometimes have theories about what happened, but actually the beauty of rock inscriptions is we have a very specific benchmark to compare our theories against. So we know exactly, at least in this period, what some people from that period believed. Yes. Okay. Um, and this uh, next one is from a mosque on the site of Seda Booker. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, now, this is in the middle of the Najev, and in this area, there were 50 pagan sites, so it's, it's quite quite an interesting one for that reason. Um, and remember, this is the late 8th century. By this time, all the pagan sites had been destroyed. I think they were destroyed in the 750s by the Abbasids. Um, so it says, Muhammad, messenger of Allah, he sent him with the guidance to make it victorious over any other faith even in the face of the Mushrikun's reluctance. Any thoughts on this one? Mm. You see, Mushrikun, it means the associ associators. Yeah. So this might be the Trinitarians. So yeah. I'm not sure, but this is, I like this one. Yeah. Um, 
And what I find interesting from it, which kind of indicates its lateness as well, is the fact it has switched from being tolerant, like in the early days of the um, the Al Mumin, you know, the believer movement, to being intolerant. You know, it's just one faith and that's it. You know. But you see here, it says that he made it victorious over the other faith. So the. You see, this is very late because the victories happened to the Abbasids. Yeah. So this is a good uh, fit. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excellent. Okay. Now, next one. Okay. Um, do you want to read this one, maybe? Uh, this is the testimony of Saeed. And he testifies that Muhammad and Isa and Uzair and all the created ones are subordinate worshippers and he testifies unto Allah and Allah suffices as a witness that he is one indivisible neither begetting nor begotten and this was written in the year 170 okay um, well, there's a lot of interesting things in there but off the bat and I'm kind of putting you on the spot a bit but does the name Uzair mean anything to you? Because I've tried to trace who this person is. Was he one of the Arab prophets by any chance? Or Actually, this is very interesting. You see, Uzair is only mentioned in the Quran. And it's like a small Ezra, if you know Ezra in the Bible. Yeah. So this is like a small Ezra. This is a... a putting him in a bad way. And Uzair, they say that he said that uh, the Jews the Jews said that he had a son, that God had a son. And Uzair ne and the Jews never said that, um, as you know. Yeah. Here you have it beside Muhammad and Isa. This is very intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> I have never seen this before. Is, is this part of, of a polemic which is bringing to mind the fact that um, the whole issue of God having a son is is that what the focus of this you think is yes because it continues and it says he, he testifies Allah uh, and that he is one and he has not begetting or begotten so here uh, Muhammad he had no sons and Isa he had no sons and Uzair maybe he had no sons here I don't know who is this Uzair you do not yeah. find them in the archaeological record. But yeah. when the Quran does polemics against the Jews, it says that Uzair, they said that Uzair was son of God. Oh, you know yeah. this, uh, this reference in the Quran? Yeah, I re re remember. It's been a while since I've had a look at it, but I remember that. It's often brought up. Um, Jews said that Uzair is son of God. Of course, yeah. they never said that. And Isa, the Christians, say that he is the son of God. Yeah. So you have here beside Muhammad two people in the same controversy of the yeah. sonship. So yeah, yeah, this is intriguing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I suppose the other thing here is this neither begetting nor begotten is also a contradiction of the Nicene Creed, which seems to be still a hot issue, you know. why? Yes, and this is in the Dome of the Rock. Sorry, I cut you off, but this is yeah. the same in the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, yeah. This is the last surah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, now we'll move on to the, the last period, the Muslim. It's dated um, to 300 AH or 912 AD. So I think what uh, Yehuda Neville is really is meaning by this is that he's giving examples from that particular year. Um, I suppose it could be that he's talking about uh, maybe the period from the last the last era, era um, 787, 787 to um, 912, maybe. So he might be ref he might be referring to the decades from um, like once again was 787 to 912. He doesn't make that very clear in the book, but we'll presume he he just means 912. Um, of course, he wasn't. Well, you very... see, you see, archaeology. You do not find what you want. You find what you find. So yeah. that's why it is. It could be that he just grouped it under that particular year. Yeah. Um, sometimes you find um, 
inscribers who are very good at dating their own uh, work. And then you have other inscribers who don't, or at least don't do it at a, at, with every inscription. So that might be part of the problem. Okay, so I'll read this one. In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful, that Allah and his angels will incline unto Muhammad and the prophet. Allah's blessing upon Muhammad and Basir bin Tamim wrote it. Any thoughts? And to Muhammad and the Prophet. This yeah, is strange. This, it is very strange. <laughs> yeah. So now, yeah, it's like it's almost like you know the way sometimes people have, have said, well, Muhammad is actually the praise one, so Muhammad is referring to Jesus. So it could be, and maybe I'm stretching it a bit too far, but maybe it's a reference to either Jesus and the Prophet, or the Prophet is the Arabic. Arabian prophet, but I don't know. It's a it's a weird one. This is very weird. Yeah, but I like it. I like this. One. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the interesting thing is, like, you have God and His angels being asked to, to incline unto Muhammad. Like, it's like if you imagine Muhammad is up on the throne and and Allah and the angels are bowing to Muhammad. That's what it comes across as. Or is it? God and his angels are bowing to, you know, or are they um, condescending to Muhammad? You see, what way is that meant? I think in this particular uh, inscription, it only works as Jesus. So this Muhammad is the Jesus and the prophet. Maybe this is the prophet, the Muhammad. Yeah. So maybe you have two group of people. One yeah. sees Muhammad as the Arabian prophet and one sees him as the Christ. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, it is quite a strange because one. it's nine twelve now. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. So maybe this cult kept going on. Yeah. Yeah, it's a strange one. Like, um, but uh, what's interesting is we don't see the forgiveness idea here so much as incline. Um, it's almost like you know, give us, give us your ear. It's not. It's not very confident that it will get what it asks from God, if you know what I mean. Whereas in the earlier one, it's almost like it's snapping its fingers at God saying, forgive so-and-so. Whereas now it's kind of like the best they can hope for is that they get a hearing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, yes, I can see that. Yes. <laughs> um, now, um, I've, I've added this in and, and probably wanted to hear your point of view. This is relevant to the debate about the chronic phrase, Allah prays unto Muhammad. But here the translation in Klein makes much more sense. Any thoughts on that one? Oh, maybe this is the original meaning. Maybe because the rocks are older. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I could think it is this. This was it. Yeah. I think I think the, the word pray, uh, pray unto is... I don't know if that is the way it's written in the Arabic, but I think... If we're being fair, I think the, the, the meaning behind it, as some Muslims have, have said, is incline. And I think that's a fair rendering of it. And unfortunately, in the way it's written, it doesn't sound right. Like pray unto doesn't make sense to me, but incline does. The, the word pray in the Quran, it doesn't mean that you have to pray the way this they did in Babylon under the Abbasids. It just means the archaic word of asking God. Yeah. So, so that's it. So yeah. maybe it could be understood here as inclined. There is no problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want to read this one? Yes. Allah incline you and your angels unto Bishr ibn Tamim. Allah's love and blessing unto Muhammad, your servant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the same guy in the upper one. Yeah. Same name. Yeah. Um, well, I I noticed here it's uh, the prayer is made to Allah, incline you. Um, again, you have the incline you and your angels onto this person. Um, and interestingly, Allah's love again is mentioned. So even quite late, actually, into the 10th century, there's a reference to God's to Allah's love and blessing unto Muhammad. So in the centuries after that, 
Anna's love seems to have been deleted. <laughs> Could this have been the Ottoman time, maybe, that they, they, uh, they got rid of such references or what? I'm getting across new material, and I think not the Ottoman time, but maybe uh, Genghis Khan uh, is the Do one who changed how all this looks. Do you mean Genghis Khan? Yes. Yeah. The, the Mongols and uh, the, these people, they were uh, horrible. So we we have letters from Genghis Khan written with his hand, and they, this guy was a Muslim, and you can see his coins. So right. maybe the Abbasid themselves, they were still not that horrible. Yeah. You see. Wow. So there's there's degrees of horribleness. So when yes. they met their match with Genghis Khan, was like right. <laughs> <laughs> no more Mister Nice Guy. Wow. Yes, he was a legend, of course, as you know. Yeah. 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 The, the meaner you are, the more successful you are, you know, that seems to be the way. Sure. Interesting. Excellent. Okay, let's uh, go from there. Uh, and this is another one. Uh, Allah be kind towards him who passes on this road. So, you know, very nice inscription, really. Um, very warm idea of Allah in those times. Um, so we're not, you know, when we look at the picture that is given from, you know, in our current times, and we think about uh, the words in the Quran, and that you don't see that kind of sentiment, do we? It's much yes. true. Um, so I would suggest that this is evidence that a lot of the material in the Quran is 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 later than this period. I, I would think. What what's your thoughts? Or maybe maybe it hasn't filtered down into the the, the popular feeling yet. Yeah. You have to differentiate between the Quran and the Aramaic mode, which was in the manuscripts, actually till the the very new ones, which is the, the ones in Turkey, and yeah. when it got Arabized. You have to pinpoint when did the Quran get Arabized, because this is the point where it changes completely. Yeah. So we do not know. It's uh, I think it's post Abbasid. But not Ottomans, it's something between. Yeah, I, okay. I guess it's during this time of the Mongols. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, okay. And let me see, I think we have another one possibly. Yeah. Um, so, do you want to read this one? I don't know who's, who's turn, but... <laughs> yes. Allah inclined unto Muhammad more free, favorably than you inclined unto any among the former ones. Yeah. You can see it is uh, here it starts uh, that Muhammad is more favored. Yeah. But it's very late that it starts like this. What are yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, if we if we were to put this alongside one of the earlier ones, you can see there's, there's a huge change in attitude. He's now at the top of the ladder, more important than any of the previous prophets or whatever, yeah, definitely. Um, and here's another one, I'll read this one. Allah incline unto him and raise him from the dead unto a desirable place and make him honourable in the eyes of the first ones and the last ones. Now, obviously, there's a clear reference to the afterlife, but I think uh, raise him to raise him unto a desirable place has a lot of significance in in respect to the last video that you did in terms of the idea of the ascension and Alexa and all that. What what what's your thoughts? Uh, I think it's just very simple. Is it? Take him up uh, to heaven, because yeah. you see, uh, these people thought the earth was flat with a vaulted dome, heaven. So you get from up uh, from down to up. So yeah. it's just as simple as that. And a desirable place doesn't necessarily mean that al Jannah with seventy two versions. Maybe it's the old way of seeing it. Getting yeah. up into a desirable place, so nothing much here. Okay, it's, it's right. just nice, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Something you know, you could actually see uh, someone uh, writing and in a prayer for someone who's died. So yeah, um, right. So we've looked at the popular inscriptions, and uh, now we're going to look at the official uh, royal inscriptions. And I suppose the, the key thing to look out for is the idea that um, 
which came first, the chicken or the egg? And I'm going to suggest that what came first is the official inscriptions and then what followed is the popular beliefs. Okay, so let's see the first one. Uh, oh yeah, when does Islam first appear in royal inscriptions? So that's the key sort of question to, to think about here. Um, Perhaps you could read the first one, Muawiyah's Dam Inscription, 58AH, or 678. This is the dam belonging to the servant of God, Muawiyah, commander of the faithful. Abdullah ibn Sakhr built it with God's permission in the year 58. Allah forgive the servant of God, Muawiyah, commander of the faithful, confirm him in his position and help him. Amr ibn Habbab wrote it. Okay, so um, what's missing from all of this? <laughs> no Muhammad here. <laughs> there is no Muhammad. Uh, there's no reference to Muslims, there's no reference to Islam. Um, all we have is servant of God and commander of the faithful and it's like as if Islam didn't exist. <laughs> um, you see, uh, yes, uh, go ahead and I'll tell you something I, interesting. Yeah, I, if I'm not mistaken, this dam was in Ta Taif, which is not far from what should have been Mecca at that time. And there's no yes, reference this is in, to it. in Taif, yes. I know this yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I think I cut you off there. You see, uh, here, Muawiyah has always been referenced to as servant of God. But uh, in Arabic, it's Abdullah. So you yeah. see, uh, in other places, Abdullah is mentioned as a name. But here, uh, you do not see the word Caliph, if you notice. Yeah. You never see Caliph. You only see Servant of God or Commander of the Faithful, which is Amir al muminin But you never see Caliph. He was never Caliph. These people never called themselves Caliph. Yeah, interesting. Was, yes, this was a later invention. And when he calls himself servant of God, it is because it is against the Sassanid Persians who thought that they were the descendants of gods. You yeah. See? Yeah. Interesting. So it doesn't know. it doesn't have to do with Islam much at this point. Yeah. Wow. It's it's interesting that it, it even it cuts out the idea of, of a caliph there as well, because obviously there's no there's no uh, reference back to Muhammad which really leads us to question um, how important was Muhammad or even whether he even existed um, prior to um, Muawiyah. Remember, so. remember uh, the Chronicle of Sibius, if we take it seriously, yeah. he talked about Muawiyah uh, a lot and he mentioned Muhammad and he never sees any link between the two. That's right, okay. If you yeah. remember this, yes. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't make that connection. though. that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so just to make it really clear, there, um, you can see where Taif is, and Mecca is, you know, stone's throw away, relatively speaking, and no mention of Mecca, Muhammad, Islam, or what else, Muslim in that but description. I, I want to tell you something. Also, there is a chronicle. I do not remember actually which one. It's an outside source for Islam, and it's one of the earliest ones. Maybe it's the Maronite Chronicle. And it says that Muawiyah, when he defeated Abu Turab or Ali, he didn't go to the throne of Muhammad. And in another translation, he didn't go to the seat of Muhammad. So maybe this Muawiyah was actually against Muhammad, like the Shia, when they say today. Yeah. Maybe he, he knew him and he was against him from day one. Yeah. That's true, and that could be the, the reason for his omission. Yes. Yeah, very good. Now, uh, so this one is quite interesting. It's, uh, it's a milestone text, and because e each of these were damaged, what they did, and they're, they both, or all four of them follow a similar uh, formulaic um, pattern, they were able to piece them together, if you like, and, and create a common text or a couple. Uh, composite okay so th this is what we have here so the servant of god abdul al malik commander of the faithful god's love be upon him ordered to straighten this road and to make the milestones 
from Damascus up to this mile and X number of miles. And uh, my little note is it uses um, a peace be upon him like formula for Abdul al Malik rather than for Muhammad. Mm, this is very, the one I was asking you about. <laughs> <laughs> very embarrassing, very damaging, I would have thought that instead of a uh, peace be upon be him for Muhammad, the. Um, God's love is directed to Abdul al Malik. Well, you see here uh, two important points. The first thing is Abdul Malik again is referenced to as Abdullah, servant yeah. of God, not Khalif. Yeah. And he is the commander of the faithful again. Yeah. God's love be upon him. Maybe this is a formula that the Umayyads used and then they later stuck it to Muhammad so that he is as great as them. They are not better than him maybe. yeah absolutely yeah that's interesting so this is 690s um and these were originally found from 19 uh, sorry yeah 1902 so these are relatively recent uh, finds and they were found in four different locations um on either side of jerusalem some were found north of jerusalem some were found uh towards egypt from from jerusalem if that makes sense Okay. Um, right, moving on. Uh, so this is from Dome of the Rock, the Outer Face, mm -hmm. from the year 692. Um, maybe, do you want to read this one? Yes. In the name of Allah, the Compassionate, the Merciful, there is no God but Allah alone. He has no associate. Say he is Allah, one. One, uh, Allah indivisible. He does not beget, nor was he begotten, and no one is equal rank with him. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. May Allah incline unto him. Wow. Okay. Now, I think it's fair to say that we can see the origin of an awful lot of the formulas that are used in the later popular inscriptions here. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Um, so... Um, so we see, like, if we take the last part, may Allah incline unto him. So this is our first example, really, in terms of chronology, where we see that. So from then onwards, post 692, we start to see it in the rock inscriptions. Um, anything else you'd like to refer to? No, but I think this is very interesting stuff. Uh, especially the one of Uzir, I think this is the most intriguing because the Quran says the Jews said the Uzir ibn Allah and, uh, and this was a very hard polemic till now we do not know when did the Jews say something like this so maybe this was stuffed in the Quran later against these people who had on their stone inscriptions Uzir as someone who was good yeah you see it was a way of, of damaging his name. Yes, so this guy, he was a good guy. Now we see from the rock inscriptions, they like this guy. Now they yeah. do not like him. So you have the, the Quran, definitely, you Uzir know, ibn Allah is a later addition. Now we can see this from the inscriptions. Yeah, yeah. I would argue as well, what's significant about this particular, uh, the, the rock inscriptions generally in the Dome of the Rock, both the inner and outer. Um, we can match them up, um, and maybe this might be something I'll look at in a future video, but if we match them up, we can detect that some of them are found, are found in the Quran and some aren't. So what's interesting is this would indicate that either there was a Quranic manuscript from which they borrowed and put into these rock inscriptions, which would mean that some verses have been lost in later editions, which obviously shows that the Quran wasn't perfectly preserved, or the text that was put here was eventually used later when they were writing their Quranic manuscripts. What, what's your thoughts on that angle? Yes, this is a situation where you have a problem and uh, you cannot escape. You will have to say that the Dome of the Rock inscriptions are the one that is correct, if you want to save the Quran. They took it and from the Quranic manuscript and they corrupted. This is the only way out. But uh, there is another point I remember. Uh, the Chronicle of Sibius 
it mentions Muhammad as a Zionist who, who is inspiring the Ishmaelites with the Israelites to go and conquer Jerusalem. Maybe it was this way, because you see Uzair here was a good guy. Then later, uh, much later, they stuffed this polemics against the Jews in the Quran and they, and they hated the Jews much later. What do you think? Yeah, um, I definitely think there was a warm relationship between the, uh, we won't even call them Muslims at this stage, but the, um, the Mu'ayin, the, the, the believer Mu'ayin. movement. Yes. Um, the believer movement and uh, the Jews had a good relationship, I would say, in the early days, be simply because they had a common goal, which was to, um, to kick out the Byzantines. And, uh, and then later, it's, the relationship broke down, but it was probably well into the 8th century when that happened. What, what do you think? Uh, I'm not sure, uh, because if you take Sibius seriously, then you have a relationship between the Israelites and the Ishmaelites much earlier. Yeah. I'm not sure how historical uh, the events in Sibius are, because yeah, they do not they do not seem to be very historical. <laughs> you see, uh, yeah, everything just goes fine. There is no other mention. So I don't know actually. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, people who have referred to it as legendary. Um, and it could be that it was written much later and retrospectively um, assigned to Sebius. I think one of the earliest copies we have is, is very late as well. Would that be right? The earliest copy for Sebius is the 15th century and it is lost. Ah, okay. So we have uh, maybe 18th century or something. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, and it is, uh, it's called pseudo Sebius. It is attributed to Sebius and we do not know if this guy Sibius was a real bishop in Armenia, actually, or even this we do not know. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the problems with him. Okay, so let's move on. And now the next one is the Akaba inscription near Tiberius, and it's dated to 693 or 702. And I'll explain briefly uh, why that is. There was a section of it um, that got broken. And because there's a reference to Abd al-Malik, we can work out as either one of these two dates. Maybe we could probably talk about which one we think it might be, but let's have a look at the description. Um, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, there is no God but Allah alone. He has no Sariq. Is that how you pronounce it? Sharik, Sharik. Okay. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. The servant of God, Abd al-Malik, commander of the faithful, ordered the straightening of this mountain road. It was made by Yahya bin Al, and that part is lost, in Muharram of the year 3, and it's either 70 or 80, so that would make it 693 or 702. Um, any thoughts? Well, the first thing that I, I kind of st sticks out for me straight off is the Shahada is mentioned, and it is the classic one from uh, the Dome of the Rock. Maybe it's 702, uh, but I'm just guessing here. Yeah. Maybe this is when Abdul Malik was more uh, prominent, if you like. Yeah. He could he could probably take the the risk of really pushing his agenda at that stage. Is that is that your but, thinking? But but remember, Abdullah bin Zir, who was against Abdul Malik. He is the first one to come up with the word Muhammad Rasulullah on his coin. So that's yeah. why I was saying the numismatic evidence has to come with the the rocks so that we get a good idea. Yeah, Abdul yeah. Malik then adapted this thing, uh, which is Muhammad, messenger of God, from Abdullah ibn Zubair. Now, why is that? I do not know. Maybe uh, there was a revolution against him or something. Yeah, I think my my thinking is, uh, it, I often see it with elections, you know, one politician is debating another politician and he wins, but what he does is he robs the opponent's ideas. And uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's a one way of conquering, not only, uh, well, how we're going to say it, it's one way of conquering the support of the opponent. You know, if you bring in 
everyone under the the same roof. So if you take their ideas, you can you grab the support from that group. It's a kind of way of uniting the the kingdom, if you like. Yes, I think now that we have enough uh, evidence to conclude that Abdel Malik wanted people to go to Jerusalem, so that he's the one who gets the money and the pilgrims. Then when he defeated Ibn Zubair, who was a rebel, he took the identity. He said, okay, come on here. Muhammad is also here. Now come and do your hug here. Something yeah. like this. Yes, that makes that makes good sense. He, he was strong enough at that stage to be able to um, take on or to um, take Muhammad's identity, or how will we put it, to take him as, as part of the package. Yeah. Because okay. the Shia, Shia, they do not venerate this uh, this building whatsoever. So maybe he didn't win them even when he did all this. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. And right. So we have another inscription from the Khazar al Hair fortress. Um, this is much later, it's dated to 728 or 729. Um, I don't know whose turn it is. Do you want to read this one? I think it's better you read the English. <laughs> okay. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, there is no God but Allah alone. He has no Sariq. Muhammad is a messenger of Allah, the servant of God, Ishan, commander of the faithful, ordered the building of this fortress. And this is one of the things the people of Hims did by Sulaim bin Ubaid in the year 110. And uh, again, we have the um, Jihada mentioned there. Um, one of the things I would point out straight off, if if we were to compare this with the previous one, do you notice how the formula is almost identical with a few few changes, but it essentially it's following the, the earlier formula for the inscriptions. Yes. What? Yes. Almost identical, yes. Yeah. Um, I noticed this as well. As this is one of the things the people of Hems did. I. It's almost like, you know, they're pointing out, hey, you know, we've done a lot of things for for, for the boss here. You know, don't overlook it kind of thing. Um, yes. You know what Hems is, right? I think that's a city in Syria. Am I right? Yes, in Syria, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and here, here also you have the servant of God, Hisham. I don't know why it's an N here, but in the servant of God, Hisham, again, you have Abdullah, not, I wonder, did not I Salif. Yeah, I don't know if I made a mistake or whether it, it was a typo in the book. So it should be M there. Yes. Yeah, okay. And uh, the Sulaim bin Ubaid is just the inscriber, I presume. Yes. Okay. Uh, I do not know who is this guy. Okay, so you see the, the Shahada is being uh, repeated in different locations. Again, we'll just a reminder, this is a royal inscription. And if we think back to when we first saw this full-scale Shahada, it was late in the 8th century. So it took decades before this um, three-part Shahada got um, used in popular inscriptions. Um, so we see certain ideas first appearing in the royal inscriptions, and then decades later, we start seeing them in the popular inscriptions. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that this is because the, the, the chicken and the egg one here is that um, the people in charge were the ones creating these ideas, and the popular um, inscriptions followed that. Would that be a fair interpretation under. yes and in history most of the time it was like this the islamic tradition would like you to think the other way around that it came from the poor people and uh, bilal uh, he was a very poor man and stuff but this is just fake we can <laughs> see here it's very clear that it comes from the royalty from yeah. the, the royalty then the people adapted maybe yeah. if you were a popular uh, you cannot write this on on your stone. Maybe yeah. you do not have the right to write something like this. This is only for the royalty. We do not know. Yeah, and they were very strict about the inscriptions. You know, the fact that they're very formal, even the popular inscriptions would suggest that you didn't have a right to just write any random thing. You had to yes. follow the the set agenda and the set formula. 
Um, yeah, okay, let's move on. Uh, yes, we mentioned that. Okay, so now go to our conclusions then. So Islam took about 150 years to develop. I would probably, um, this is according to Nevo, I would probably say much longer than that. What, what do you think? If, if you take the full picture of Islam. Mm. It, to take the full picture that you know today, uh, Ottoman Empire, no doubt. Yeah, to, yeah. To take the picture you know today. Yeah. So we're but, talking. Uh, if we are talking, uh, as we have seen from the rocks, yes, 150 years to develop the ideas at least. Yeah. Okay. The rock inscriptions indicate that popular devotion to Muhammad began in the 8th century after a cult of personality was inaugurated through official declarations beginning with the Dome of the Rock in 692. Um, I think that's a fair conclusion to take from those inscriptions, would you think? Yes. Think so. um, early Abdul al-Malik road milestone inscriptions don't mention Muhammad or the Shahada. So that's quite interesting that in the early ones of his, no reference to Muhammad or the Shahada, but they came in later. Yes, it came in after he defeated Ibn Zubayr. This is also a milestone, very important. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. So we kind of have a before and after in, in his reign, yeah. It was only in the 730s onwards that there is evidence of a popular devotion to Muhammad as a prophet and messenger. And this is quite a bombshell, really. Um, it, it shows that the whole Islamic tradition is fake, essentially, isn't it? Yes, and maybe this is close to the Abbasid time. Yeah. So we can pinpoint who is the guy who was the caliph, if you like, or Amir al-Mu'mineen at this time. Then we see what happened. Yeah. So the idea, you know, that Muhammad was going around um, Arabia and setting down laws for people and every everyone is widely po uh, following him and 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 doing everything he said and that it's it's clearly not the case if you look at the rock inscriptions that this is this has been generated by um ibn um ishak and uh ibn uh hisham and and then all the hadith writers they, they have created this myth of muhammad is, is how i would read it yes this is definitely the case yeah and so there is a hundred year silence prior to this that indicates that Islam did not exist as a distinct religion until long after the time of Muhammad, which casts doubts on whether he had any part in starting the religion. That would be the key conclusion I would make. Any, any uh, thoughts on this one? Yes, uh, I agree. I agree that Muhammad may be I think the most historical you can get from Muhammad is the what you have in Sirius. Other than that, I think is myth. Yeah. I, nothing stands to. This is the only idea maybe that was real. Yeah. Uh, in, in my in my opinion, but Muhammad did not, did nothing to do with the Quran, of course, and all that. Yeah. A, a debate that's kind of um, raging at the moment is there are, say, one group of people who think that we have early uh, Quranic material from be before the 690s and this proves that the Islamic tradition is correct. And then there's others who say, no, no, Abdul al-Malik and, and his followers are the ones who wrote the Quran. Um, we had a discussion earlier about this. Could you, would you like to share your, your thoughts on that and uh, those early uh, the, materials? Yes. This problem arises from the idea of the language. What is the Quran written in? If it's written in Arabic, then uh, it changes the whole game. But I argue that it's written in Aramaic. So if it's in Aramaic, whenever you find the Quranic manuscript, you do not know the date because it's in Aramaic. As Gabriel Salma says, it's written in Aramaic language in an Abatean script. And this is what we find in Mesopotamia also. The Quran most probably was written in Mesopotamia because the way it does plural for uh, certain words, it's only in this region. So maybe there were Quranic material before Abdul Malik and even before Muhammad, like the ones against the Coleridian heresy, 
which was maybe in Haram, and this is a place also close to Mesopotamia. And they adapted this and then added to them uh, yep. by the stage of Abdel Malik. And Al Haggag, we have also uh, maybe clear evidence that he wrote most of the Quran, Al Haggag, which is the governor of Abdel Malik. Yeah, and is that made... Al, Al Hajjaj? Is that yes, I... Hajjaj, yes. Yeah, 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 okay. Yes, I think that's a strong, a strong one. And actually, this material, then, if we're talking about, even if it came from the 640s, you know, even if they have uh, what they think are Quranic manuscripts from the 640s, these are not really Islamic. These are tracts that are written in Aramaic that were used later, and then what was produced later, it could be described as Islamic. Would that be a fair depiction yes, of it? Yes, you, you have, for example, the story of the cave and stuff. They, when you read in the Islamic tradition, you feel that this is a separate surah. They say, they say if you read this on Friday, uh, it will be better and the angels will come down and stuff, as if it's a sage or something that is old, much different. And we can see from John of Damascus that Surah 2 was not part of the Quran. It says that uh, this guy had uh, parchments and Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah 2. Yeah, so it's a by distinct... this time, yes. So by this time, you you had all these parchments. You do not have anything combined. I guess Al Hajjaj, who is the governor of Abdul Malik, is the first to combine the Quran, but it was not one hundred percent Arabized, and he added some stuff, of course, and he made it official to read the Quran in the mosque. This is uh, significant, also. Yes. And his coins changed a bit. Although he had Khosrow the second on the coin, I do not know how. This is something we will see in a, a future video. So you have uh, Zoroastrian fire temples on the back of the coin of Al Hajjaj, and on the front you have La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So this is crucial stuff. And it's weird, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you you know you have you have on one side of the coin. Uh, supposedly a monotheistic um, prophet. On the other side, you have a completely different religion that's, you know, yes, so, he, so has, he has He has Khosrow, the second image on the coin also. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Well, thank you, um, Murad. Um, it's been a, an interesting discussion, and I'm sure um, the audience will really appreciate um, this uh, material. And uh, hopefully it will lead to a future debate on Quranic manuscripts. It's, that's something that um, it definitely uh, we need to look at at a later point. I don't feel at the moment that the, the cement has properly set on uh, Quranic manuscripts just yet. It seems to be still in flux. Would that be fair to say? A lot of scholars are in disagreement about the dating and so on. Yes, you have to notice something. The first reference to the Quran in the Islamic uh, like literature, I think is called the Caliph Protocols or something like this. And it calls it Kitab Allah, so the Book of Allah. It never calls it the Quran. Maybe just calling it the Quran is something late. Yeah. So when we look at the historical documents, do not look for the word Quran. This is not... Uh, you're not going to find it. Yeah, you're not going to find it, exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, well, thank you, Murad, and uh, hope to talk to you very soon. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me.